If you cannot see it, uh, please go out. We cannot allow people sit, uh, standing in the uh, uh, room. I see there might be one place if you shift, but not, there, there not everyone. Uh, so it's time. So welcome next our next speaker, Oleksi, and his talk about SpectreFast and uh, bringing SpectreType vulnerabilities to the surface. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Oleksi Oleksin, as you said. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, how can we detect uh, speculative attacks with the um, common and conventional dynamic testing techniques, such as fuzzing, for example. Oh, it doesn't work. Really? Oh. Okay. Um, why does it not work? Okay, now it works. Okay, so let's start with the, the motivation. Does it work? Yes. Uh, let's start with the motivation. I noticed recently one pattern in uh, information security talks that usually the speaker begins uh, the presentation by trying to scare the audience off. Uh, so let me give it a shot as well. So are you ready? One, two, three, boo. So <laughs> what do you say? It's not scary? You think it's actually kind of cute and cuddly? Well, let me tell you something. You are wrong because this is a, is a vicious beast. This is spectre. This is a um, speculative vulnerability that was detected a few uh, years ago, or rather found a few years ago, and uh, it allows us to, or the attackers, to bypass uh, common memory safety techniques that have been deployed for many years. Already. So to remind you how it works. Uh, here we have a normal buffer flow. We have an access to an array uh, with an index. This index could be larger than the size of the array. We will have an overflow and read some memory from outside of the bounds of this array. How we normally fix it, we add a bounds check here. Um, so we check whether this index is within the bounds of this array. And um, yeah, it's supposed to fix the problem. So that's how it has been done for many years. It's applied uh, in memory safe languages, well, in most of them. Uh, this is how we patch memory vulnerabilities in C and C++, and it's supposed to solve the problem. Right, right, well, no, <laughs> because now we have Spectre. Uh, Spectre works uh, by bypassing these vulnerabilities as follows. Say we have the same snippet of code, uh, we have the array of size 10, and we execute it repeatedly several times. So the first time we pass the index of one, uh, accordingly the bounds check succeeds, we uh, execute the, the memory access, then we execute it again, now the index is three, again true, we execute the memory access, now it's two, same story, but suddenly the index is one gazillion. Uh, it's literally one gazillion, it's way uh, out of the bounds of the array, it's somewhere far, far away from it. So what happens here? Well, the thing is that this uh, comparison, it takes uh, some time to, uh, well, to calculate it. So for example, we might have a cache miss um, while doing the comparison. Uh, we might have some hardware fault, so it takes some time. And um, modern CPUs, or rather the architects of modern CPUs, try to squeeze as much performance as possible out of them. And we really don't want to stall the CPU for this long period of time, because uh, until this comparison is resolved, the CPU doesn't know where to go next, whether to, uh, to go into the true or to the full branch uh, of this code. Um, so how do they deal with this normally? Uh, well, they implement uh, so-called branch predictor. So here we have a situation. Uh, we have uh, uh, the CPU asking this module branch predictor, what will happen to us? Uh, well, the branch predictor um, looks at the history of this uh, uh, branch or similar branches, uh, sees that in our specific example, uh, it passed once, it passed once again, it passed once again, so we had three passes. Well, the fourth time, probably the same thing will happen, you will pass. So the CPU, being naive, it believes uh, the branch predictor and it starts to execute uh, this memory access and all the following code as well. Although it does not uh, exactly execute it, uh, or rather, it does not execute it as normal, but it executes it speculatively. What speculatively means uh, is that uh, it does all the computations necessary, or it loads all the data necessary, but it does not commit the results. So all the temporary results during the speculative execution, they are stored in internal buffers of the CPU, and they are not visible to the software. Uh, eventually when the, uh, yeah, so this, uh, and eventually when the CPU um, the text that this prediction was wrong, it just discards the results and starts over from the correct branch. However, the problem here is uh, that even though the speculative execution is not visible to the software, it still leaves certain traces on the microarchitecture level. 
What it means is that, um, for example, it might leave traces in the caches, it might start uh, some execution units in the CPUs, for example, ADX unit uh, is fired up uh, during speculative execution, or could be. And uh, the attackers, uh, if they know uh, about this feature, about speculative execution, they could uh, derive um, the results of speculative execution, so for example, the result of this uh, memory access uh, from these traces. So it's possible to do. However, you might ask a question, isn't it a CPU bug and shouldn't it be fixed uh, in the hardware, right? Well, um, it's understandable. Um, well, it is a valid question because uh, effectively what we are doing, we're giving uh, to the CPU a valid code which does not have a vulnerability. And uh, the problem is that the CPU itself is executing this wrong, not in the way that we expected it to execute. So it's kind of supposed to be uh, fixed on the hardware level. However, if we look at uh, the strategy at what uh, the CPU uh, vendors are planning to do with these vulnerabilities, so here's, for example, a table from Intel's website. Uh, it lists uh, as rows uh, future models of Intel CPUs, and here as columns we have uh, different uh, versions of attacks, uh, microarchitectural attacks, not only Spectre, but also Meltdown for Shadow and some others. Um, in most cases, uh, it will, in fact, be patched uh, on the hardware level. So, for example, Meltdown, it's mainly in hardware level, um, yeah, for others as well. So MCU here stands for uh, firmware uh, patch. Uh, however, the story is different for Spectre because here uh, everything is supposed to be patched in software. So effectively, what they are saying is that even though it's a flaw in our products, we are not going to uh, directly deal with it on the hardware level. So it is effectively our responsibility as software developers to deal with the hardware issues. So what can we do about it? Well, uh, the first, or rather one of the first uh, proposed solutions to that was to add serialization points everywhere. So serializing, there are such uh, instructions uh, in x86 uh, CPUs that um, do serialization. Serialization means that they effectively stop uh, speculative execution. So for example, uh, Intel has LFANS, and the suggestion was to put LFANS after every conditional branch. So this does uh, fix the problem. It does prevent Spectre. However, there is one big issue. It's very slow. Uh, on our benchmarks, the programs became somewhat around five times slower. There is another better approach, more sophisticated. Uh, we could add data dependencies between uh, the conditional branch and the memory access. So here, uh, here's how it's implemented. Uh, it's somewhat better because it doesn't completely stop speculative execution, but instead only delays the memory accesses that could be vulnerable. But it's still pretty bad. It's around 50% overhead. So from this, we can conclude that we need more precision. We want to patch not the whole program, but only those parts of the program that are actually vulnerable to Spectre. Um, how do we do it? When we uh, came up with this conclusion, we met in our group and we asked ourselves this question. How do we find Spectre? Well, uh, we thought, can we draw a parallel with other vulnerabilities? What are the, uh, the mechanisms and the tools that are used to detect other types of vulnerabilities? And one of the trending techniques that we came up with is, is fuzzing. So how does FASM work, to, just to remind you? Um, it's a relatively simple conceptual technique. We just uh, test the application that we have uh, with the randomly generated in inputs, or pseudo-randomly generated inputs. Uh, so in our case, in this specific case, we would generate a random integer, assign it as an index, and then execute this code repeatedly. To actually detect that we have a buffer of flow, we might want to use some memory safety techniques. For example, address sanitizer is one of those, uh, which would verify before every memory access, it would verify that the pointer is uh, valid. So it points to a valid object and not to some random uh, place in memory. However, the issue here is that even though uh, this technique would uh, detect memory safety violations, it will not detect spectra. As I said before, uh, spectral, or speculative execution uh, in general is not visible to the software. So here, uh, this check will always be valid and address sanitizer will not detect anything. So now, we ask ourselves, how do we make it visible? How do we make speculative execution visible, uh, which is a hardware feature? How do we make any hardware feature visible to the software layer? Well, let's just simulate it. Let's actually execute the code that is uh, uh, ran speculatively. 
And here's how it works. So basically, that's the idea behind SpecFast. We simulate uh, uh, speculative execution, and then we fast. So let's say here's the concept. Let's say we have this control flow graph. We have uh, node A uh, entrance point. Uh, it could be, for example, um, an if-else statement, and uh, it goes either into node B or C. So C could be um, the if branch. Uh, B could be the else branch. And our simulation, what it does, it inserts an additional node A simulated, which is uh, identical to the original A, but it has the uh, opposite uh, exit condition. So, for example, if A enters B, uh, uh, A simulated would enter C, and vice versa. Uh, however, speculative execution, it doesn't last infinitely. So it has uh, some boundaries. It uh, can, uh, for example, on Intel CPUs, uh, it lasts at most 250 instructions. So it's rather short. Uh, to simulate that, we additionally take a checkpoint before uh, entering the simulation. So we store the state of the process. And um, periodically, we check whether we reach this boundary of 250 instructions, and we exit the simulation and roll back. So how it works, uh, we would execute uh, the, we would take a checkpoint, execute the simulated branch, uh, execute the simulated path. Then eventually, when we reach 250 instructions, we roll back. But we notice that we roll back not to the simulated uh, node, but to the original one. And then we execute normal code. And we repeat the procedure for every conditional branch here in the program, in the application that we test. And uh, yeah, coming back to an example, to the code, how it works in the code. Uh, here again, our victim function. We have, as previously, we have a condition, a memory access, and we store the result. Um, here, now bear with me, we'll have an assembly, because uh, uh, SpecFuzz is implemented as uh, a backend pass uh, in LLVM, so it's effectively a compile time binary instrumentation, so they have to go into assembly. Uh, that's how this victim function compiles. To uh, we have uh, comparison, uh, jump if less than, then we do a memory access, and uh, we store the result. And this is the instrumentation. Uh, as I showed before, before starting the simulation, we take a checkpoint. So here we call the function specfast checkpoint, which stores the state of the process. Then we insert a sequence of instructions that uh, reverses or makes the direction of the branch opposite. So we had the original jump was here, jump if less than, we inserted jump if greater or equal, so the opposite direction. Then, uh, in the end of every basic block, we call a function that checks whether we reach this limit of 250 instructions, or, well, the, it actually depends on the CPU, but for Intel CPUs, currently it's 250. Uh, and if we did reach, it rolls back to the checkpoint. And uh, finally, we want to actually detect uh, those memory violations, uh, so we, oh, yeah, we also count instructions here. And uh, yeah, so to detect uh, memory violations, we just uh, use the address sanitizer, which, uh, yeah, so we call a send load, which checks whether this pointer is within the bounds of the object. So basically, that's the idea. That's the concept of spec fuzz and uh, yeah, high level implementation. Now, let me show you a quick demo of uh, what you can get out of it. So that would be a demo of fuzzing openness. So, yeah, right now, let's see whether it works. Okay, perfect. Um, here we go. Uh, here we have uh, OpenSSL, which is built already with uh, um, SpecFuzz. We have a driver for OpenSSL. Here's, oh, too quick. Uh, yeah. Just give me a sec. Yeah, here's the driver. So, Fuzz server, it's a driver shipped with uh, OpenSSL, so it's a fuzzing driver, something that we test. That's the application that will be fuzzing. Uh, yeah, and if we run it even with a single input, that would be the output of it. Here we have a whole bunch of lines that are produced, and every line here is uh, a single vulnerability detected or a single speculative uh, overflow detected by SpecFuzz. So you immediately can see a difference between normal testing of an application and uh, testing for spectra, uh, speculative vulnerabilities, because here we have many more results than normally. Normally, when you would um, test an application, so for example, for buffer overflows, just with address sanitizers, uh, you would find maybe one vulnerability in an hour, maybe in a day, maybe you would spend a whole week fuzzing and you won't find anything if it's a long established project. Here, uh, in a single second, you might find hundreds uh, or even thousands of vulnerabilities in the worst case. And all of them are, so even with a single input, we found a lot already. So we have to deal with this. Now, how fuzzing 
looks like here. Let me move it away so it doesn't cover. Okay. Yeah, now we can fast this thing. Yeah. Um, for fuzzing, we are using here just HonkFuzz. It's uh, one of the fuzzing tools that are available. This one is from Google. Yeah. We fast the application with the HonkFuzz. We do 10 runs here uh, on a single thread. Uh, we use the same fuzzer as previously, so it's the driver, server driver from OpenSL. As a starting input, we use corpora of inputs uh, from OpenSL again. And notice here that that's the difference from normal fuzzing, uh, that uh, we are piping the, this output, this long list of vulnerabilities uh, into a script that collects them and uh, aggregates into a JSON file. Yeah, so now let's run the fuzzing. As in runs. Of course, it takes some time because because of this instrumentation, the program becomes quite a bit slower. Still usable, but slower. So it will take some time. Yeah, we can skip it. Okay. Um, after fuzzing, we got this file analyzer.json. And this is uh, a file of all these aggregated values. It's not very useful. Every line here. So the hex values here are addresses of the. Uh, offending instructions in the binary, so it's not very useful. Um, it's more convenient to work with them uh, as to with, work with code, with code lines. So after the aggregation, we also symbolize uh, the results. So here we have another script that symbolizes them and turns the binary addresses into the code lines, into the addresses in the code. Yeah, and uh, to, to show you one example of what we can achieve, so what we found uh, in OpenSSL, now there will be one vulnerability that we found there. So it's in the crypto uh, part of the of OpenSSL. Yeah, here we go. Uh, the vulnerability is here. It's in the crypto part of OpenSSL. And we have uh, the same pattern as I showed you before. Uh, it automatically found uh, a, vul a vulnerability, a speculative overflow. Uh, we have a memory access, so we have an array access. Uh, controlled uh, index here, and the index is bound checked here and here. So almost exactly the same pattern as I showed you in the very beginning. It's an openness. Yeah, so that was the demo. But um, now what? We found the vulnerabilities, and we found many of them. Uh, if you have a list of, say, 100 or two, even 200 vulnerabilities in your software, you probably don't want to patch it manually and go all go over all of them and uh, try to fix them manually. So uh, to deal with this issue, somehow we uh, implemented another tool. It's more minor, but still quite useful. Uh, we took uh, a, a few of the tools that automatically patch programs, but patch all the conditional uh, branches in the program. So for example, as in the beginning I showed, um, there are tools to add offenses after every conditional branch or add data dependencies after all conditional branches. We modified them to instrument not the whole program, but only those parts uh, that we um, either did not test or those parts uh, where we found some vulnerabilities. So it's a white list approach. And uh, let's see what we got there. So, here, there will be a plot of um, speed up uh, of several uh, applications, several libraries that we tested. Uh, uh, we have OpenSL here. We have a few parsers. So this one, for example, is JSON, YAML. Uh, we have a compression algorithm, HTTP. And uh, on the y-axis, we have a speed up with regard to full instrumentation. So it's a ratio between um, the runtime of the application when it is um, when spec fuzz is applied, so we have only partial instrumentation, only those uh, parts that are either not tested or where we found vulnerabilities uh, are instrumented uh, with respect to full instrumentation. So all conditional branches are instrumented. And here are the results. Uh, they're quite different here. In some cases, we found very few vulnerabilities, like in Jasmine and JSON, we found, I believe, only two vulnerabilities, and accordingly, the improvement is huge. So everything else is, does not require instrumentation anymore, and uh, in OpenSL we found quite many, so the improvement is not so much, but still it's quite considerable. It's around 25% already. And mind that uh, this tool is uh, on a rather early stage. Uh, we believe we can do much better right now, but it's already a quite good start, I would say. So, yeah, um, that was it. If um, 
I gave a presentation on a rather high level. There is quite a lot more to it. So for example, how we deal with nested uh, mispredictions. For example, several branches could be mispredicted at the time. Uh, how we deal with uh, collecting results and uh, everything else. Um, you can see it uh, in our paper. Uh, it's uh, open, uh, openly published. It's on archive. You can find it. And uh, we also published this tool on GitHub, so you can try it out. Here's the link. But please be gentle, because it's first academic code, and uh, we have recently refactored it, so there might be issues. But if you find any issues, just write me or open an issue on GitHub. Yep. So that was it from my side. I will ask uh, for your questions. And if you want to talk to me, just uh, either find me on the conference or write me there. Thank you. Really, uh, we uh, we actually execute the speculative path. So we are forcing the program. So we have a conditional branch. We have uh, the branch which uh, the program should take. So given an input. So in, for example, in uh, where was the example here? Yeah. So for example, here, uh, say x value is ten here, or let's say the size of the array is ten and x value is eleven. So it's out of bounds, and we are not supposed to enter this function, no, or rather this branch. Uh, we are inserting such a snippet of code that forces the program to actually enter this branch, execute for some time, and then it rolls back and uh, executes the correct code. Yeah, so that's how it works. Uh, yes, you could. We just found it more convenient to implement it. Oh, okay. Uh, so the question was um, whether it's possible to implement it without source code. Um, my answer would be yes, you can do binary instrumentation. We just found it more convenient to do it uh, on the LLVM level. And again, it's first a prototype, so you can re-implement it as binary. Could you please repeat? So it's a nice talk. Thank you. Um, have you thought about combining the, so you, you um, instrument the program to add the speculative branch as well, basically, but then you do phys uh, fuzzing. Have you thought about doing static analysis instead of fuzzing um, to build a sound analysis? Um, uh, there are actually approaches for static analysis, uh, quite many. Uh, there is a respecter from GR Security. Uh, there are some tools. For, there is a tool from uh, Red Hat and so on. But uh, so far, from what I saw with my experiments, so the problem with static analysis depends which kind you use. So if you have symbolic execution, uh, a static analysis, then it will be sound. Uh, but the problem is overhead, so it's, it takes a lot of time to analyze it. And there are approaches for that, too. There are tools uh, for it uh, which try that. Um, for example, Spectacular, there is uh, this one. Um, and as of more classical static analysis, which is like pattern matching, the problem there is false negatives. So uh, this, these kind of tools, they normally find only those vulnerabilities that, or rather those instances of Spectre uh, that are envisioned by the developer. And Spectre might have different variations, and those won't be catched. Yeah. Right, thanks. Yeah. And actually, it's in the paper. We have some evaluation for that, too. A little bit. Uh, sorry, I speak a little bit English. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, could you be so kind to share with us uh, LibreSSL results? Because it's a fork from OpenSSL, is security okay. focus. Yeah. And another question, what's happened if sure. I try to disable my multi-threading in BIOS? Uh, I can barely hear it. Could you repeat? Multi-threading. Yeah, if you disable multi-threading, it uh, becomes better, but it's not sufficient. Not uh, yeah, so it's usually a first recommendation to disable hyper-threading because with the hyper-threading enabled, the attack is easier to launch. But with it disabled, it's not impossible to launch. It's just harder. So it like, okay. rises the bar, but you can still... So the uh, thing with hyper-threading... Do you still have time? 
yeah. Uh, so the thing with hyperthreading that, um, okay. So if you want to start speculative execution, you have to first train branch predictor that it should go into the path that you want uh, want it to go. And you can do it either inside the program, as I showed in this example, but you, it's not always possible. So sometimes uh, you cannot control the direction of the branch with the input that you fit to the program. With a hyperthread and enable, you can train branch predictor uh, from a hyperthread, from a different hyperthread, because it's shared between hyperthreads. Otherwise, well, it depends, of course, on the architecture. Did but you already test it, uh, LibreSSL? Uh, Did you already test it, LibreSSL? No, we didn't. Uh, yeah. Could it be so kind to do it and share with uh, us results? We can talk afterwards, but yeah, I'll be gladly. I'll gladly do it. <laughs>